I'd like to begin by reading Romans chapter 1. We'll read verses 1 through 7, chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, 1 through 7. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for, for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom also you are called of Jesus Christ. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1, Paul writes that we should emulate him as he emulates or follows Christ. Be ye followers of me as I also am of Christ. Writing those words to the church at Corinth, they were to follow Paul's example as he sought to follow Christ. And even so, Christians today can do that same thing in that Paul was a follower of Christ. He certainly wasn't sinlessly perfect. He sinned, he made mistakes, and yet in the areas that he was faithful to Christ, then we can pattern our lives after his example. In Romans 1, 1 through 7, we find some descriptions of Paul that I believe are worthy of our consideration. And this morning, I'd, I'd like to focus with you on verse 1 as we think together about those descriptions of Paul. In this passage, we have, you might think of it as Christianity condensed. We have three words, three words that in a sense summarize the Christian life. These are descriptions of Paul. And as we study these matters, I should consider how do these things apply to my life? Am I a servant of Christ as Paul was? The three key words servants, saints, and separated. Servants, saints, separated. Those are the three key words of this passage. So let's think together about that first word which describes the life of Paul. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. It was common for the Apostle Paul to describe himself with the term servant. We find this in the book of Titus, chapter 1 and verse 1. We find this in Philippians, chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints which are in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi. 1 Corinthians 9, 19, and other passages, we find Paul identifying himself as a servant. This was typical of the Apostle Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1, he describes himself as a servant. Why did the apostles and other inspired writers describe themselves as servants? One reason they did that is that Jesus taught his disciples to be servants and to think of themselves as servants. In Luke 17, verse 10, Scripture says, So likewise, when, she, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. Unprofitable servants. And so, Christians are to view themselves as servants. A few moments ago, Britt led us in a reading of Mark chapter 10, 42 through 45. I want to read with you again, beginning at verse 43 of that passage. 
But so shall it not be among you, but whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. A minister is a servant. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Even Jesus came not to have others minister to him, but he came to serve. He came to be a servant to others. And he sets for us the perfect example. He taught his disciples to view themselves as servants. Paul viewed himself as a servant. And therefore, you and I, we should think of ourselves as servants of Christ. But what is a servant? The word translated servant in this passage is a word that refers to a common slave of that day. A slave was one who had a master and was under the authority and control of his master. Paul had a master. His name was Jesus. And Paul was under the authority and control of his master. Paul was a servant. He was a servant, a slave to Jesus Christ. Every accountable person in this world as I speak is a servant. He is either a servant of sin or a servant of righteousness. There is no middle ground. There is no third option. Every accountable person is at this very moment serving sin or serving righteousness. Now, why do I uh, present these two options? Only two. Turn a few pages in your Bible to Romans chapter 6. And notice what is written in verse 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey? His servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. You see, Paul only presents two options, doesn't he? He says either you will be a servant of sin or a servant of righteousness. But, verse 17, God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. There are those who are slaves to sin. They don't realize it. Many of them don't think of themselves as slaves. They don't believe that sin controls their lives, that sin is a type of dictator in their lives and yet that's the very picture presented in Romans chapter 6 whether the sinner understands his condition or not it doesn't change the reality of the situation every responsible person before God who has not become a servant of righteousness is in fact a servant of sin but all of that can change when one obeys from the heart that form of doctrine, Romans 6, 17, he becomes a servant of righteousness. When one obeys the gospel of God's Son, being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, he becomes a servant of righteousness. And so it is with the Apostle Paul. At one time, he was a servant of sin. But a drastic change had occurred, and he was now a servant of righteousness. Have you thought about what Paul gave up to be a servant of righteousness? Have you considered the sacrifices that he made? In the book of Philippians chapter 3, we read about Paul's credentials as a Pharisee, as a leader among the Jews. I'm reading now Philippians 3, beginning at verse 4. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof to trust in the flesh, I more. Now consider, circumcised the eighth day. And that was in keeping with the law of Moses. Paul makes the point, I lived in keeping with every detail concerning the law of Moses. Of the stock of Israel. Those Jews who took such great pride in being able to trace their ancestry all the way back to Jacob, 
or Israel. Paul said, I can do that. Of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. When there was a revolt in Israel, there were 10 tribes that went to the north and established the northern kingdom of Israel under the leadership of Jeroboam. The tribe of Benjamin, however, remained in the south with Judah. And this tribe remained more dedicated to God for a time. And Paul said, I can trace my lineage back to the tribe of Benjamin. Benjamin was the tribe located in proximity to the temple. And whatever benefit there might have been in living close to the temple, Paul said, I can claim that. I am of the tribe of Benjamin. And Hebrew of the Hebrews, not just a Hebrew, but I have pure Jewish blood flowing through my veins. A Hebrew of the Hebrews. And as touching the law, a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. I was a stickler in keeping the law. Every detail, I dotted every I, crossed every T. I kept the law, I was a Pharisee. I was of that straightest sect of the Jews, despising Christianity and doing all I could to put an end to the church and to Christianity once and for all. But then he tells us in verse seven of that reading, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ, counted loss, that he might be a servant of Christ. He gave up the authority and the power he had as a leader among the Pharisees. In Acts chapter 26, we find that he had the authority to give his voice against others and have them put to death as a persecutor of the church. He had that authority, Acts 26 and verse 10, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And yet, he changed. He was sorry for having sinned against the church, against Jesus, and he became the great apostle to the Gentiles. And now he preached that message he once once sought to destroy. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 23. I now preach the faith which once I destroyed. He went from persecutor to preacher in one lifetime. And he was a servant. A servant who suffered beatings. A servant who was frequently imprisoned. A servant who knew what it meant to be naked, cold, and hungry. A servant who knew what it meant to be shipwrecked. A servant who knew that he would die a martyr for the cause of Christ. 2 Corinthians 1 verses 7 and 8. Paul indeed was a servant. And every Christian today is a servant. But you might think to yourself, but I don't do great things as Paul did. I don't establish congregations in various locations as Paul did. I am not an apostle as he was. So I can't claim that I'm a servant as Paul was. But every day you get up and go to work and you live soberly, righteously, and godly before God, you are a servant. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Titus 2, 11 and 12. Every day you get up and go to school and you let your light shine before others. And you show Christ in your life. You are a servant. When you teach your children the precepts of God, you set a good example before them. You're serving Christ. When you do good to others, Galatians 6 verse 10, especially those of the household of faith, you are a servant. In addition, a servant seeks to please his master. That was certainly 
Paul's goal. He writes in Galatians 1 and verse 10 that if he sought to please men, he should not be the servant of Christ. Oh, he didn't seek to please men. His goal was to please the Lord. And even so, as a servant, that is your goal, to please God. We will never find favor with the world. We're never going to fit in in this world. The world may scoff at you, criticize you, mock you for your faith. And it should be no surprise. You are a servant, a servant of Christ. And it's your goal to please God, not men. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, the Bible says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. The world didn't know Jesus. Oh, the world did not receive Jesus, approve of Jesus, or accept Jesus. And therefore, it shouldn't surprise you that as a servant of Christ, you'll not be received well. You'll not be accepted and approved by the world. The world will scoff at you for your doctrinal beliefs. The world will scoff at you because you pursue holiness and righteousness. That was the case with the Apostle Paul. It's been the case with every faithful child of God from that time till the present. Christians are servants of God. That leads to a second observation. The Christian life in three words, the first word, servants. And now that second word, saints. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Well, Paul was an apostle. He was an apostle of that same God who raised his son from the dead. And he writes to us in Romans chapter 1 and verse 1 that as an apostle, he was called, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. I want us to think about the word called. Down in verses 6 and 7, notice again the reading. Among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ? To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Well, Paul, as Saul of Tarsus, was called. You recall how that on the road to Damascus there was a bright light that shone down from heaven. He was blinded by that light. He was instructed to go into the city of Damascus and there he would find out what the Lord would have him do, Acts 9 and verse 6. After he went into Damascus, after he had fasted and prayed for three days, Ananias, a God-sent preacher, came and instructed him to arise, to be baptized, that his sins might be washed away. Paul was called of God. He was called to be an apostle. He was not one of the original 12, but he was an apostle nonetheless. He wasn't appointed by any man or group of men. He was appointed by the Lord himself. He had a divine appointment. And yet, you as a Christian have been called. A number of times people have asked me, now, now you were called to preach? How did that happen? How were you called to preach? And maybe the person asking the question expects me to say, well, I was traveling along the highway and there was a bright light from heaven and I saw the light and, I, and then it described this experience. That's not the nature of our calling. In 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 14, the Bible says, whereunto he called you by our gospel. We're not called through a vision. We're not called by some mystical experience that we can't uh, explain how and why it happened. No, we're called in a rational way by the gospel. Every Christian is called by the gospel. And what is it that we are called to be? We're not called to be apostles, 
There are no apostles today, but we are called first and foremost to be saints. Notice again in that reading, in Romans chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, we're called to be saints. Well, what does that mean, called to be saints? The word saint, in the root word, it means to be sanctified or set apart. And so those who are saints are those who are set apart for a holy purpose unto God. We're not of the world. We're in this world, but we're not to be of the world. No, we are saints, separated unto God. You might consider 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2. Paul writes these words to saints. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours, called to be saints. When you obeyed the gospel, God was calling you through his word, through the gospel. There wasn't a miracle that was being performed, but you heard the gospel message, you understood it, you believed it, and you made a rational response to it, and you answered the call of the gospel. Acts chapter 2 and verse 40. You became a saint, one who is set apart unto God. That word saint is a word that is abused in the religious world. You may hear someone use the word to refer to someone of exceptional holiness. Well, I try to live a, a faithful life, but I'm no saint. I'm no saint, meaning that I have shortcomings shortcomings and weaknesses. I'm no saint. Well, the fact of the matter is, we are saints. If we have obeyed the gospel, every Christian is a saint. There is the belief in the religious world that one can reach sainthood after one dies. You become a saint in time. And in Roman Catholicism, there are some very popular saints. There's Saint Patrick, there's Saint Peter, John of Arc, a host of other saints. And people reach sainthood based on a life of good works and on prayers of those still living and so forth. One can become a saint of God. The Bible knows nothing about becoming a saint of God after death. Rather, you presently are a saint, a sanctified person, one who is set apart for a holy purpose unto God. And for that reason, we should not feel at home in this present world because this world is not our home. We sing, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Peter wrote these words, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. 1 Peter 2.11 As strangers and pilgrims. Strangers? Yes. That is, we're not native to this world. We, we're here now, but we're leaving this world. We're going home. We're not at home here. We're going home. And we'll be with God when we get home to heaven. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17, the Bible says, Wherefore come ye out from among them, and be ye separate. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Be ye separate. And so we are separate from the world. You may feel out of place at times. Young people may feel out of place when their friends are talking about their plans for Friday night. Oh, it's going to be a wild time. We're going to the party and hope you can come. You may feel a bit out of place. Well, that's to be expected because you are a saint of God. It may feel a bit awkward when your co-workers are talking about having a few drinks after work and would like for you to come along. It may a bit, be a bit awkward because you are a saint of God. I heard about a man who 
as an older gentleman with a family, decided he would obey the gospel. He'd lived an ungodly life, but he was truly converted. He believed in Christ. He turned from his sins in repentance, made the confession, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God and was baptized for the remission of his sins. He went back to work and his buddies didn't understand his decision. And they began to question him, well, what do you do for fun anymore? You don't drink beer, you don't chase women, you don't gamble, just what do you do for fun? He said, I get up every day and look in the mirror without holding my head in shame. I get up and look in the mirror with a clean conscience. That's what I do for fun. We're saints of God in this world. And we're never going to feel at home in a world where we really don't belong, in a sense, because we are headed for heaven. We're headed home as saints of God. And then there's a third word in this passage I want to share with you, and that's the word separated. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Separated unto the gospel of God. As an apostle, Paul was separated for his work as an apostle. He had this mission as a minister and preacher of the gospel. And as an inspired man, he was an apostle of Jesus Christ. Well, when did this separation occur? You might look at Romans, or rather in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 15. We find that from his mother's womb he was set aside to be, set apart to be an apostle. But when it pleased God, Galatians 1.15, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. And so there was in the mind of God a separation even from his mother's womb. There was also a separation in his conversion to Christ. A few moments ago I made reference to Acts chapter 9 how that Ananias was sent to Saul to give him instruction from the Lord. Ananias was a bit reluctant to go to Saul. He had heard of his reputation that he was a persecutor of the church. It's in that context that we find these words, God speaking to Ananias. The Lord said, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So God said, you're going to be set apart in your obedience to the gospel. You're going to be a minister, a witness unto me. You're going to go and share the good news of redemption with the lost. And then there was an official separation in Acts chapter 13, on the occasion of Acts chapter 13 in verse 2. The Bible says, In Antioch, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. Separate, set apart Barnabas and Saul, because I have a special work for them. And that work was spreading the gospel message. Even before he became a Christian, he was set apart in a sense. He had decided that he would be a Pharisee and that was his own man-made decision. But God had a divine appointment, a divine separation. And God had his his goal and his will that Paul would be an apostle to the Gentiles. Paul's life was dedicated in every sense to the spreading of the gospel of Christ. He felt compelled to preach the message. 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 16, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Woe is unto me. And so it was something that he felt so strongly about that he said, I am compelled and woe is unto me. 
if I fail to preach the gospel. Every Christian today is in a sense separated unto the gospel. Oh, you're not an apostle. You may not be a preacher of the gospel, but there's a sense in which we are all separated unto the gospel. I say that because Jesus said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Go with the gospel. There are no apostles here today. The apostle Paul isn't around to go preach the gospel. So who's going to do it? Who's going to share the gospel with your neighbor? We all have a responsibility to do what we can to share the gospel. Maybe as a deacon in the Lord's church, there's work that you can do to help advance the cause of Christ so that souls will be saved. People will hear the gospel. And they'll respond. Maybe as an elder of the church, as a Bible class teacher, or a song leader, or maybe you are a people person. You have good people skills and you can invite others to come to services or you can set up a Bible study that can be conducted by someone else if you don't feel that you're equipped to do that. You can tell others about the radio program. You can just live a good Christian life before others and let your light shine. And others will see the example that you set because you are separated unto the gospel. We're all to do what we can to share the gospel with others. One day, those who now live separate from the world, that separation will become very clear. On the final day of accounting, we read that there's going to be a separation. The Lord will come, Matthew chapter 25, he will come in his glory and all the holy angels with him and then he shall sit upon the throne of his glory and before him shall be gathered all nations, now notice, and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats and he shall set the sheep on his right hand but the goats on the left. He will separate them, those who have lived for the Lord in this time. They'll be placed on the right hand. They are the ones who have prepared themselves. And they're prepared because they have been saints in this world. Oh, they haven't lived sinlessly perfect, but they have been faithful to the Lord as members of the spiritual body of Christ the church. And they have been separated unto the gospel of God. They have served God in this world. And now they are ready to meet God in judgment. Well, a separation is coming. And if we want to be prepared for it, we need to be prepared now. The only way I can know I'll be ready for judgment is to get ready and to stay ready. Well, how does one get ready for the coming separation at the judgment? In order to be saved from sin, one must do as we read in Romans 6 and verse 17, obey from the heart, that form of doctrine. What is involved in obeying that doctrine? One must believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, John 8, 24. One must turn from his sins in repentance, Acts 3, 19. One must confess his faith in Christ, Romans 10, verse 10. And one must be baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 22, 16. At which time one gets into the body of Christ, Galatians 3.27. And then you can live a faithful Christian life and you can know that heaven will be your home. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58. This is God's plan for your life. You know, God had a plan for the Apostle Paul. And Paul, he lived in keeping with God's will for his life. What about me and what about you? Have you obeyed the gospel? Have you lived a faithful Christian life? We're singing this song to encourage anyone who may need to respond. If you need to come as one who needs to obey the gospel or be restored to your first love, we invite you even now as we stand and sing.